Flux is a state-of-the-art image generation model. It takes a text input and generates high-quality images from it. Although this model can do incredible things, it can't produce photos of specific people. In this video, I'll walk through the full process I used for fine-tuning Flux to generate unlimited high-quality photos of myself. So here I'm going to walk through a pretty straightforward process for fine-tuning this model using Python and Replicate. The workflow that I use here has four key steps. So the first step is to get a set of images of myself to train the model on. Next is to write captions for each of these photos. And then we can pass these image caption pairs to Flux to do the fine-tuning. And then finally, we can use the fine-tuned model to to generate new images. And we can see some fun examples of that on the right here. But before going through this whole process step by step, there are a few key requirements. One is you'll need Python 3.8 or newer installed on your machine. You'll need a replicate API key. Finally, you'll need 10 to 20 high quality images of yourself greater than 1024 by 1024. And this is actually not too hard. If you just go on your phone or something like that, usually the images are much higher resolution than this. So these will be like all sorts of shapes and sizes. So here a handful of me. Finally, I'll call out that the example code that I'm going to walk through here is freely available at the GitHub repo shown here and also linked in the description below. To start, we're going to import a handful of helpful Python libraries. We'll import pillow to do some image processing, OS to load and save files to particular folders. We'll use the shell utility to compress our training data. The most important import here is Replicate. They have a Python library that is basically a Python front end to their API. So that's going to allow us to do a lot of key steps in this process. Then this import isn't super necessary, but this is just how I chose to import my Replicate API key. We can actually see that here. Load.env is just this method that will look in your Python directory, look for this secret.env file, and then it's going to make any environment variables that you have stored in this secret file available to your Python script. So I just chose to import my replicate API key in this way. You can do the same or alternatively, you can just hard code your replicate API key into your Python code, which is just simpler. What that'll look like is we're going to create this replicate object. And basically all we're doing is we're setting up a connection to the API and passing in our API token. I'm just grabbing my API token from this dot environment file. But similarly, you can just hard hard code your API key here. So with all the imports out of the way, we can start processing our training images. Here I use 20 images and here are eight of them. And you can see that they're all different shapes and sizes and resolutions from different angles with different haircuts, with hats on, different facial expressions and things like that. Diversity is a good thing here. It's just gonna make the fine-tuned model outputs more flexible. Many of these were for my iPhone. So they had the .heic file type. So I needed to convert them to PNG and JPEG. So I took that and then I put them all into a folder called raw. But there's a problem here. Since these images are of all different shapes and sizes, these aren't optimal for training flux on. Really what we want to do here is make sure that all the images are square and they are the same resolution. Specifically making sure that we crop all these images, make them square and have them have a resolution of 1024 by 1024. To do that we can use Python. I'm going to define a handful of helpful variables. I have all the raw photos saved in this raw directory and then I want to pre-process them and save them in another directory called data. Here I'm just checking if this data directory exists. If it doesn't it's just going to create it. Finally I'm initializing this image counter which will basically keep track of the number of images that we have. I'll use this for coming up with the final image file names. To actually do the pre-processing here's the code for it. It's quite long, but I'll go through step by step. Basically, we're going to look in the input directory, so that raw subfolder, and we're going to iterate through every single file. We're going to go through each file one by one. We're going to take the file. We're going to check if it's a PNG or JPEG with this logic here. And if it is, we'll go ahead and do this chunk of code. So the first thing we'll do is grab the 
image path. This is basically just combining the input directory name, which will be raw, and the file name, which we're getting from this loop here. Then we can use the pillow library to open the image. So basically we provide the full path of the image and it'll create this image object, which will allow us to process it in Python. As a first step, we wanna make the image square. So that'll involve cropping it. And I actually had ChatGPT write this logic for me, but I'll explain what's happening. We'll take the image and get its size. So it has the size attribute. It'll give us the width and the height. And then we're gonna pick out the smallest dimension. The reason is we wanna make the images square. So basically we're gonna use the smallest dimension as the final dimension size for the square image. So for example, if the image is 2000 by 3000, we're gonna take that image and crop it so it's just 2000 by 2000. Next, we're going to define how we wanna crop it. So this is gonna consist of picking four different coordinates, basically four different numbers that are gonna specify the left, top, right, and bottom of the image. We're gonna take the original width and we're gonna subtract it by the new size. If the width was the smallest size, this is gonna be zero. But if the width was the largest size, this is gonna be a positive number. And then it's gonna be adjusted a little bit to the right. For example, if the width was 3000 and we wanna change it to 2000, this will be 3000 minus 2000, which should give us 1000 and then divided by two is 500. So basically the left coordinate is gonna be shifted to the right by 500 pixels. And then we'll do the similar thing from the top. So if the height was the largest size, we'll adjust it accordingly. And then finally, we'll just add the new size to the left and top coordinates that we defined earlier. Now that we have these four coordinates, we can simply crop the image just using this crop method for the image. Now we successfully made the image a square, but the training strategy that we're gonna use, they recommended to use 1024 by 1024 images. So basically what I'm doing is I'm downsampling the image because all of these are higher resolution than 1024 by 1024. But basically we'll just reduce the resolution from a higher quality to this 1024 by 1024. And then as a final step, I'll just save the image as a PNG. So what I do here is define a new output path. It'll be output directory, which was data. And then I'm gonna define a final name. I just call it image dash I. I was initialized to be zero. So the first image is gonna be called image dash zero dot PNG. And then we'll just save this resized image to this output path. Finally, we'll add one to I, and then we'll repeat the whole process. By the end of this, we'll have 20 images saved in the data directory with file names ranging from image dash zero dot PNG all the way to image dash 19 dot PNG. And then we can see the resulting images. You can see it's the same image, but now they're all squared and they have the same resolution. If you have raw images where you're not the subject of the photo, you may need to do some additional cropping to ensure that you're in the center. Also, it's better to not use images where there are multiple people in it. If you're trying to fine tune Flux on yourself, just use photos where you're the only subject in that image. So we have these training images. The next thing we want to do is generate captions. Although we could do this manually for each of the 20 images, just writing a caption, I took a different approach and used this multimodal language model called Lava 13B, which is available via the Replicate API. Basically, I'll go through each image one by one, pass it to this model, have it generate a caption, and save that caption. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to iterate through each file in this output directory, which is called data. Then we're going to check if the file ends with the file type PNG, which it should because in the pre-processing step, we saved all our photos as PNGs. And then we'll do a similar kind of thing. So we're going to create this image path by joining the output directory in the file name, and then we're going to open up this image object. Then what we'll do is we'll use Replicate's API. We're going to interact with this Lava 13B model put out by Yo Rick VP. And this is like the model version. It's getting cut off here, but the full name is available in the GitHub repository, just like a very long character sequence. And then we can pass these inputs to the model. So we'll pass it the image, which we just created here. And then we'll prompt the image by saying, please write a caption for this image. This by default will create this output object, which is an iteratable. It's optimized for streaming the text responses. So what I do here is I take this output object, I convert it to a list, and then I join each element of this list with a space. That's just gonna give us a single string of the model's response. And then this is a key point here. So instead of just using this response as the caption itself, it's important that we include a trigger token. So what this is, is a unique 
unique sequence of tokens, which is not a real word, that we include in all of our captions so that the model learns to associate this trigger token with my face. So after fine tuning, if we want to generate an image with my face in it, we just include the correct trigger token and it should hopefully do that. I just take a really simple strategy here and prepend the response with the string of a photo of Shah Taleb. Finally, I save the caption as a text file. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking the image path, which for the first example will be data slash image dash zero dot PNG. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just dropping the PNG and then adding a dot TXT. So we're saving the caption with the same exact name as the associated image, but we're just replacing dot PNG with the dot TXT. And then with that, we can print out the caption and then we can write the text file to the data directory. At this point, we have 20 images and 20 captions for that image all generated automatically. The next thing we want to do is to compress this data folder as a zip file so we can upload it to Replicate's API to do the training. So I just use the shell utility module to do that. Data is what I want to call the zip file. So it'll be called data.zip. Zip is the compression strategy that I'm going to use. And then data is the folder that I want to compress. The result of this line of code will just be a zip file called data.zip. Now we have our training data. That was the hard part and also the most important part. Now we can fine tune the model in a pretty straightforward way. In fact, we don't even have to write any Python code to do this. This guy, Jarrett Burkett, he has this company called Ostris and he created this training endpoint on Replicate that you can freely use. And there's actually a web UI for it. So you can actually go to this URL replicate.com ostris slash flux dev lora trainer train and basically the whole process that we're going to run through in python has a convenient web ui so you can just take that zip file we created and upload it to this web ui to do the same exact thing just to show you what that looks like this is the web page and then there's some instructions and so basically there's a form here that you just upload the zip file to and you can set specific parameters if you like and it'll just create the training for you automatically but let's see how we can do this process with Python. The first thing we want to do is create a new model on Replicate. First, I'm putting in my Replicate username. Then I'm going to define the name of the model. I call it Flux Shaw dash fine tune. I'm going to make this model public, but you can also make it private. Here, you're going to specify the GPU you want to use for inference for this model. But I guess Replicate overrides this. So I got this code from Replicate's blog on this process. So I guess it doesn't really matter what you put here. Maybe it's going to replace it with the H100 either way. Finally, we'll put in a description. So I just called it flux.1, fine tuned on photos of me. Then we can print the model name and the model URL. Then we can train the model. Now we're going to create this training run. So here we're going to use this training endpoint from Ostris. We'll upload our zip file with all our images and captions. We'll define how many steps we want to train the model for. And then we'll specify where we want the fine tuned model to be saved. These are things that we just created in the previous slide. And then this training job will get kicked off so we can print the training status and then you can view the status on your replicate dashboard. Again, the full name of this endpoint is getting cut off here, but the full name is available on GitHub. And I also linked the training endpoint in the description below. So training took about 12 minutes for me and it cost $1.12. But after that's done, we can use the model. This UI will get spun up and we can see it did use a H100. So I guess it didn't matter that we specified to use a T4. But what's really cool about this is that it by default creates this playground that we can interact with a fine tuned model with. So let's actually check that out now. Here we see the model flux Shaw fine tuned and then we can specify a prompt. So this is not a trivial process. I found found that it's a bit of a learning curve to figure out how to effectively prompt Flux, but I slowly figured out a couple of tricks and heuristics. So let me try something like a cinematic portrait of Shah Taleb. So we're using our trigger token, a hooded man sitting in front of a Mac book pro writing code the background is dark and the light from the screen illuminates his face he has a serious and focused look on his 
face. And then I found that these weird keywords tend to work well, like cinematic, lighting, intense, just like random things like that. I'm by no means a flux prompting guru, but we'll see what this spits out. We can alternatively also upload an image that we want to condition the model output on. This is handy if you wanna like take an image and basically make a version of it with you in it. You can also upload a mask file if you want to just do the image generation for certain parts of an image. We can set the aspect ratio. So I'm gonna do 16 by nine, which is what YouTube videos are, but there are a bunch of options Options. If you do custom, you can customize it. You can set what the prompt strength is. So basically one, the model will only listen to the prompt. Zero, the model will only listen to the input image. We can specify what model we wanna use. So there's dev and Schnell. So Schnell is like a faster version. And we can set number of outputs. So I'll actually do four, which is the maximum. Inference steps. This is basically the number of times the image is passed through the model. And then we can do a guidance scale. So lower, I guess is more realistic, but I'll just set it as default. Then we can have a random seed to make it repeatable. And then we can select the output format. I'll just keep it as a web image, output quality. And then there are these other things. So like safety checker, go fast, megapixels, LoRa scale. Because this is using an efficient fine tuning method called LoRa, this is adjusting how much the model is gonna listen to those adapter weights. And if you're not familiar with LoRa, I talked about it a bit in a previous video in the context of large language models, but the same idea applies to this this context of image generation. Okay, so let's see what this produces. So it does take some time to generate these images. I'm doing four images. It usually takes like 30 seconds or so to spit these out. Let's see these examples. These are pretty good. So this is me coding. Oh, this is another one. We see the, the MacBook. Oh yeah, this is good. This could be a thumbnail or something. Oh, this is interesting. There's like a little reflection off this screen. I honestly like these. I'm gonna save these. So you can just click on them to download them. Let me see if I can add a camera angle. Camera is angled directly toward man. You can easily find yourself spending way too much time playing around with prompts. I know I did. I think eventually you kind of learn some tricks and figure out how to prompt it the first time to give you something that you like. This is another, this could be a good thumbnail as well. Not a huge fan of that one. Okay, this is interesting. Oh, this is cool. I like this as well. I look kind of like an alien in this one. My eyes are too close together. And it's interesting. So using a playground is fun. You can get you some prompting chops and produce things things pretty easily. However, we can also do the same exact thing through Python. So this is helpful if you wanna create like a new UI or you wanna experiment with several different prompts or several different parameter choices, or if you wanna just generate a hundred images, let it run, you go do something else, and then you can come back and just view all 100 images or something like that. This is how you can just do it through Replicate's API. This is very similar to what we did with the Lava 13B model, but now we're just gonna specify the fine-tuned model, and then we specify all the inputs we want to pass to it. And then again, the output object is this iteratable. So it's going to generate a bunch of URLs to web pictures, which we can print out like this, and then we can click on them one by one, or you can download them directly to your computer. So I played around with this for a while, and here are a handful of pictures I made of myself with generous appropriations of hair and physique. I also really <laughs> like this one, because if you look in the background, it's just like a bunch of variants of me. It looks looks like some kind of very weird dream that you wake up in. Love the hair here. This me as a surfer, I've never surfed before. But yeah, these photos are like really high quality. Here's some more, so here's me as a doctor, so I can send this to my parents to let them know I've made it in life. This one looks very realistic, so this is like a more accurate photo. But also, you know, this is me as a quarterback. This is in the likeness of that shot of Cillian Murphy in Oppenheimer. You can definitely have a lot of fun making images with this model, and this is actually super valuable to me because this helps me create unlimited images for thumbnails, which is a very time consuming part of making YouTube videos. Okay, so what's next? Here, I used Replicate to do this whole process and it made it super easy thanks to J.R. Burkhead and that training endpoint that he made conveniently available to everyone. But you know, there's one downside here. So I generated maybe a few dozen images and then to do the training as well, it cost me about $7, which is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. But of course the research 
researcher in me wants to pick this thing apart and have like a deep understanding of everything that's going on. So the next step I see here is to figure out how to do this whole process completely on my laptop. So that's training the 12 billion parameter model and running inference for it. So I don't know if it's possible. I just got a new MacBook. It has an M4 with 64 gigs of memory. So I'm going to try it out and then I will hopefully have a video on that if everything goes well. All right. So I hope this video was helpful to you and you can make a bunch of entertaining photos of yourself with this. And again, the code I walk through here is freely available on GitHub. And with that, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.